Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Dwight Barnes, and uh, Dwight has uh, got some interesting concepts. One of the things that he does is he has a myopia coordinator who particularly highlights uh, the things about myopia in their practice. So I'm excited to share with you Dwight Barnes, a myopia coordinator in your practice. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you again for joining us today. We're with Dwight Barnes. Dwight, how are you on this beautiful day? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Uh, we are uh, excited to have you. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and you and your wife practice together? So tell us a little bit about the practice that you guys are in. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my wife and I were, uh, we graduated school together. We went to Southern College of Optometry, class of 02, and we graduated together and, and after doing residencies, uh, settled back in North Carolina. And uh, wanting to kind of forge our own identity a little bit, we, we made an intentional decision to not work in the same practice initially. But as we started thinking that having our own practice is something that we wanted, you know, th then that's what brought that about. So yeah. uh, looking for a community to put our practice in, uh, we were intentional about thinking about where we might want to live and sure. Cary, North Carolina, which is just west of Raleigh, uh, kind of a okay. suburb of Raleigh is uh, one of the areas that we were really attracted to. It's great for families. It's got good schools, things to do. It's a very, very safe community. And, you know, it's uh, it was just a really nice area for us. So we put our practice there and, you know, we opened in 2008. We went through all of those lean days early on where you have very, very few patients and, you know, kind of twiddling your thumbs and wondering what you can do to uh, increase awareness of your practice. But as those things tend to go, if you're in a good area, it does grow. And uh, and it grew steadily over time until the point where, you know, we were both able to work in there at the same time. And, it, you know, interestingly enough, after intentionally not working together, we love working together. I mean, it's great to be able to pop over to the other side of the hallway if you get that second between a patient or yep. we'll call each other in on a consult. Hey, you know, why don't you tell me what you think of this, which is a, which is a pretty cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how. um how your myopia practice is functioning today. You know, I'm at, at, you were sharing with me earlier that it, it wasn't something that you started right out of school, but you kind of got, got, uh, got into it via um, Albert Pang and Steve, uh, Bill St Steffens. And, um, you know, two great guys who yeah. really have the heart for myopia control. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today and what your practice looks like now. Yeah, totally. So, you know, the, the way I got put in touch with those two guys who were, were certainly a great influence for me early on was that there were some meetings that I was going to regularly a couple of times a year. And those guys were both involved. So there's plenty of times where you're talking shop and talking about what's going great with your practice and uh, learning from each other and uh, knowing they both did quite a bit and seeing that there was a need in my community. I was getting questions from patients even before I offered that service. Yeah. So I uh, I decided to put my effort into learning what I could, not just about orthokeratology, but myopia control in general and the different things we could do. And um, it turned out that I was in a really good location for it. You know, when once we started offering this service, um, we really saw it grow faster than I thought it would possibly grow. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't know you, you have to charge a certain amount for those types of services. Right. And, and yeah. you don't know if the market's there, you don't know if people are interested and, you know, people prioritize, you know, they, they find a way to do the things that they see value in. And so it really just becomes, how do you share with them the value of it and let them make that decision. But, it grew steadily and uh, we kind of positioned it as a practice within a practice, you know, kind of thinking it as this very specific component of our office. Yeah. And, um, and as it grew, I started realizing the need not only to involve my staff and educate my staff in a more general sense, right? You know, even the people who don't deal directly with patient care, maybe they're in our optical, if they know when they understand the value that this service has, both for the patient and the practice, because it's certainly valuable to both, you know, they'll promote it 
for me. They have an outside RX coming in and, you yeah. know, they, they realize the pay, parents making the comment, oh gosh, it just gets higher every year. You, you know, that's a great opportunity to educate them. And then maybe a bit more in a specific sense, what we were talking about previously, uh, a myopia control coordinator. And that's really yeah. what we evolved into. Um, how, how long into doing myopia management and at what point did you start bringing that on and saying, hey, we need somebody who who's specific for this? You know, I'm trying to remember. So the person who does it now is not the person who was initially in that position. I've been mm-hmm. really fortunate to have three different coordinators. Yeah. And they've all been really good. They've all made the position their own. They don't do it the same way. They've all changed it and 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 modified it. So the first one I had was pretty early on. I'd say I'd probably been doing myopia control for two to three years. And um, I had somebody who was one of my um, one of my technicians, one of my medical assistants who um, she was just really had a good, friendly, comforting way. And so my thought was, well, she'd be very good at doing these uh, trainings for ortho K patients, being that they're young and they're sometimes a little bit intimidated by the process. And that's really why I started. It wasn't for the process of coordinating the entire program. I just thought, who better to teach them how to put them in and take them out? And be patient with them. So I took this person, her name was Rhonda, and put her in that position. And she did well. Uh, she she was interested in it. You know, she asked me questions. I taught her more about it. And you you um, you, gradually... you you probably were like, hey, help me, Rhonda. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, and so she did well with it. And then uh, so she did that uh, position for a while. And she was uh, one of my older employees, and she ended up retiring. Uh-huh. And when she retired, I had another uh, team member at the time. Her name was Sarah. And Sarah actually wore ortho K. I had fit her in ortho K. Oh, great. Cool. She was doing easy patient. She was a uh, young 20s. She was a uh, low myo, no cylinder. And she, I mean, she, easy. She could wear it every three days and, and see 2020 perfect, right? Yeah, perfect. Um, but she was a natural person to move into that because she wore it. So it was very, very easy and natural for her to explain not sure. only how to put them in and take them out, but also kind of understanding the questions. Well, what do I do if I put it in and one of them feels weird? You know, explain, Mm -hmm. take it out, give it a little rant, see if it feels better when you put all those little things that you don't always think to tell a patient, but someone who wears them, it comes very naturally to think about those things, right? So, um, and and Sarah kind of made it her own and, and worked with me towards, she had ideas for marketing it and things like that. And then uh, time came later on, we were moving Sarah into a different role in the practice to do a, a different job that didn't really jive well with being the coordinator. And so my, my current coordinator moved into that role, and it was another one of my technicians. Her name is Kristen, and she's been doing this for a while now. Um, she's been in this, uh, I should have looked to remember, but she's been doing this for uh, probably about three years, I would say. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, she's great for the role. The, the two things that that I think really the three things I would say are the most important for that role would be number one, patients, because, you know, mm-hmm. they're dealing with these young patients. They need to, they need to be able to teach them and, and, you know, to help them along. Number two, they need to be organized because yeah. as the clinic gets busy, you're ordering so many different lenses and you need to keep up with who needs a follow-up, who doesn't need a follow-up, um, you know, who needs, who are we exchanging? We need to get the lenses back and things like that. And then the last part is, you know, they need to be smart. They need to, they're going to educate patients. And instead of just repeating something that they've memorized, if they can understand all these concepts, they're going to explain them so much better. And, and you know, Kristen is, is very smart too. And so she's curious and she asks questions. And I've spent several meetings, you know, going over why, why we do it, why it's important, why we might fit this patient in ortho K and this patient might use atropine and relative benefits and some of the challenges and you know she's smart and she understands it and it makes it really good for coordinating with patients so t- tell us a little bit about what this person does like what are all the things that you have a myopia coordinator do and is mm-hmm. that something that maybe other people just say that their technician does but you have one right. designated person right and you know and and i think in a lot of practices any of the given technicians probably can do that. I think it depends a little on the volume sure. and it might, it might depend on the extent. How do I want to put it? The extent to which you specialize in it. You know, we, we try to make the myopia control education central in our practice, meaning even though not every doctor in my practice does it, they are all aware of it and aware of yeah. the need of it. And, you know, present that to patients and 
funnel patients into that myopia control program. Mm -hmm. But that patient education goes so much better when you have someone who is very knowledgeable Mm -hmm. about it. And the benefit of focusing a lot of those efforts on one specific team member is that they become maybe second only to me, she becomes the best person in the office to have that discussion. So, and we don't always have time to have that discussion. You know, a patient comes in, we don't necessarily know when they schedule, if they might number one, be a candidate for myopia control or number two, even be interested in myopia control. So we get in there and we're doing the regular, you know, checking the optos images and doing the refraction and looking to make sure their, you know, color vision was okay and all the different things. And then it comes time at the end of the exam to have that myopia conversation and make sure that the patient and the parents are aware that, yes, it tends to get worse at your age and there's actually things we can do about it, but you don't have all day to do it. And for someone like myself, I can be a little verbose and I get excited about it. I could go on forever and I don't have time to go on forever in the exam room, right? I got a patient Guilt. in the other room. We're all way. guilty of that, Dwight. So, We're all, we, we, you know, we keep going so on about it. The beauty yeah. of it is I can do the short version, right? I can say, hey, there's things we can do. And we have these really cool programs and, um, you know, it really does matter with future eye health. And I can just hand them off, right? I grab one of the brochures. I bring them over. Um, as they're kind of moving up front to get checked out, I can go grab Kristen and she'll grab one of her business cards and come over and, she takes it to the next level of the conversation. And depending on how inquisitive the parent and the patient are, it might be moving all the way through covering a lot of details with it and maybe to the point of going ahead and signing them up to come back in and scheduling them for a myopia control evaluation, right? Uh, Move forward with uh, ortho K or what have you. Or it may just be providing a bit of information, answering a few more questions and making sure they have a solid point of contact with their future questions. You know, they want to call back and it has to do with that myopia control. They know who to ask for. They've got her card. They've already met her. And and I think that's helpful that they've already met her. And so they know who they're talking to. And that uh, opens up for that conversation. And the other side of it is if, uh, if they don't call back. It's not necessarily that they're not interested. People get busy, you know, parents and kids, and they might have four different kids involved in all these different activities and they just forgot. So we're not going to badger them, but she'll reach out to them again, give it a couple of weeks. And if she hasn't heard back, uh, she might send them a little bit of a link to our website, or I've done a few YouTube videos where I just kind of discuss some various aspects of myopia control that I think might be of interest to parents, kind of like, how do we measure for progression? Why does axial length matter? How does ortho K work? Things like that. And she might just kind of based on her conversation before, send them a nice email to follow up and a link to a couple of those videos and say, hey, you know, uh, if you have further questions, email me, call me and we can make this happen just so they don't drop off the radar. Yeah. What would you guess is the con- is is the uh, is that would be the consequence of if you just got rid of that position and went back to a normal technician? Do you think your conversion rate would drop? Your amount of time with the patient would increase? Uh, that myopia wouldn't be as substantial in your practice? What 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 is the cost of lost opportunity in I this think situation? It's, I think it's going to be the conversion rate. Yeah, uh, I think that's the big thing. Um, I mean, I've if I think further education is needed, I will just spend the time and do further education and I might Mm -hmm. get behind a little bit. And, you know, we all get behind a little once in a while, Yeah. but I really think, um, you know, you, you want your patients in general to feel special. Mm -hmm. You want to care about your patients and you want them to know you care about them. And Mm -hmm. to do that, you need to have a certain number of touch points there. Right. Well, as the doctor, You're happy to talk to them, but you're not quite as available. If they call the office, hopefully you're very busy and you're in a dark room spinning some wheels in there. You know, you're not just ready to grab the phone, uh, even if you might be perfectly willing to talk to that patient. So that touch point is incredibly important. And and to me, it's kind of a matter of kind of hitting your your mission. You know, everybody's got their values that they want to hit. And if one of your values is, you know, taking good care of your patients and you firmly believe that myopia control is important, then if you're not prioritizing it and you're not giving the patients a way to get answers to their questions, for some patients, it might be a simple one-step process. I mean, I certainly have patients come in in my area. Patients are educated and they talk and they know other people who come to our practice. And, you know, there's the two different sides of the coin. I have patients come in where when I get to that end of the exam and I start the myopia control conversation, 
I can tell they're just waiting for me to mention ortho K or just waiting for, you know, they, that's what they came in. They just didn't say it when they came in. So that's the easy one, right? They just want to know, yes, is it an option? Great. Can we sign up now? Perfect. But then there's the other patient who they need to digest that. That's a big decision to make. Um, whichever way you go with myopia control, if you came in not having any clue, number one, maybe that your child was nearsighted. Number two, that it gets worse over time. And number three, that there might possibly be a consequence of it getting worse and even have any idea that there's things we can do about it. And you hit them with that. Most of them aren't ready to make a decision. And I certainly don't want them to feel rushed. So anything that helps them take whatever little steps they need to get to a point where they feel really comfortable saying, okay, I get it. Myopia control. That's where we want to go. This is important to me. Let's get this child signed up. Yeah. So you kind of laid out some attributes of who this person is and probably all of us in, you know, that might be thinking of doing something like this, have somebody in our practice already in mind. What would the next step be is like, uh, you know, I'm thinking, well, I, now I have to train this person. What are some things that we need to be training this person in? Um, and, and how did you go about doing that? You, I mean, just recently in the last three years, you, you trained a new one, yeah, right? Sure. So how well, you, I mean, it helps to have yeah. one that can help train the next one. Absolutely. <laughs> always... But I, I think the biggest thing is, is not so much the technical aspects. If you have someone who's a good, uh, optometric technician, they can learn how to operate the equipment. They can learn how to take a good topography, yeah, you know, that. they yeah. can they've already probably learned how to do content lens trainings is a matter of saying, all right, this is how you do it with a rigid lens. Cause we don't outside of ortho K, we don't fit as many rigid lenses as we do soft in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, but they can learn how to do that. It's, I think it's really the, the actual knowledge part of it. You know, um, I had, when I was, uh, when we were moving Kristen into that role, I had several meetings where I sat down and kind of, I had made my, my list of notes that I really wanted to cover, right? And I'd say, hey, you know, let's talk about orthokeratology. Why does it work? How does it work? Why do we do it? Let's talk about myopia control. Why is it important? You know, just being in our practice, she knows that to some degree because we kind of drill that into our team members. Um, and you build on a knowledge base, right? You know, you, you kind of let them, I started off early on and this has evolved as we've had new people move into the role with a big frequently asked questions list, right? Like these are the questions I get all the time. Here's answers to it, right? But you want them to be much more knowledgeable than just reading from an FAQ. Yeah. And so it requires conversations. And that's, I think, the biggest commitment. It's not teaching them to do a specific skill. It's teaching them the concepts, the broad concepts. So, you know, when they talk to a patient, I guess the way I put it is when Kristen talks to a patient, the tone of that conversation is very yeah. similar to the tone when I do it. She won't use the exact same words as me mm -hmm. um, because she's a different person, but the tone is the same. It's, hey, look, we're not going to push you. You don't have to do myopia control. We're going to educate you that it's a great idea. This mm -hmm. is why it's a good idea. And this is exactly how it kind of can look in our office. And then if you decide you want to move forward from that or have further questions, then we're going to help you uh, address those questions. Yeah. And, the, yeah. and the other part that I, I don't think I mentioned previously is, yes, I hand off to her. The other doctors hand off. Uh, my wife, who doesn't do myopia control, but she most certainly understands its value and funnels plenty of patients over into that part of the clinic. Um, She understands the concept. She's smart. She's a doctor. But Kristen explains it so much more frequently. Kristen's probably going to explain it more effectively and more efficiently. Right. Um. There's no reason for another doctor in my practice to have a 10-minute conversation on myopia control. They can have a two-minute conversation and hand them off to somebody else to continue that. Sure, sure. Now that makes point. Now, now, um, when uh, do you do you pay her uh, for like her conversions? Like, does she get paid a, a bonus or a spiff or anything like that? No, um, we, we treat it similar to other positions. You know, we, uh, the pay, there's kind of a standard range, right? And the things that'll increase that are learning new skills or gaining new responsibilities right. in the office. So, you know, it can pay more because there's additional responsibility there. Um, and certainly things like getting another, you know, moving from a technician to a CPO to a CPOA and things like that. I mean, those are good skills for anybody who works with patients, right? Um, yeah. You know, sometimes in addition to, if you want to call it the informal education, which is Q&A, 
but also getting the formal education in the form of a of a program that gets you a certain certification. I mean, they're going to hit different things. So, so that's kind of the the way we look at it there. Yeah, that's uh, that 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 really is is helpful. I, I particularly like the part about they know who to talk to when they call back. So one other thing I'd like to mention on yes. that too is you know we'd spent so much time going through you know, the education and teaching her. And one of the things I'm really proud of is uh, there was a day um, earlier this year, I forget which month, and my wife and I were both out of the office. It was a no doctor day in the office. So, you know, you're going to have phones ringing and you're going to have things to do, but there's less traffic through the office. Mm -hmm. And my office manager had kind of blocked out part of that day for staff training and challenged the team to come up with something they wanted to teach. Well, I was uh, I was out of town with a, a family trip and uh, and, you know, this person put together a PowerPoint, you know, and all about myopia control. You know, we've had new people come in and maybe they don't know as much about it as they should and just taught a class, did a PowerPoint on it. And uh, from everything I hear, did a wonderful job. You know, people were asking good questions and they were engaged. I got a chance to look at the PowerPoint. It was fantastic. Really well done. And uh, I love anything like that where. You know, I can find someone who has a skill set that can be beneficial and then to empower them to to take a larger role in the office. Yeah. Well, obviously, you're able to educate this person on myopia, but are you utilizing any outside resources to to help educate them as well, to help connect them and and drive them towards the myopia world? Not really. I mean, we'll, we will utilize some of our social media platforms with myopia control content in addition to other content from other areas of our clinic that we put in there. Um, but it's all really internal, um, you know, and, and kind of the way I, I thought about it when, when we were trying again to kind of gain a little traction, gain a little foothold for this part of the clinic to grow was um, knowing how many people either were a candidate for myopia control or were in a family or had a friend that would be a candidate for it or had a friend who had a child who would be was create a system where it became almost impossible to come to my office as just a regular routine exam and traverse all the way through that experience and not become aware that myopia management is a thing and it's a thing that we specialize in. And it's just a whole bunch of little pieces there, right? You know, there's there's information on our website where people are often going to fill out their paperwork ahead of time. There's information up front. We have, you know, posters that we've either created or borrowed and modified, um, anything like that. You know, we, we've, we've got some great fo- uh, posters in our uh, pretest rooms and in our exam rooms kind of explaining about, you know, why high myopia can be a big deal and some of the methods we can use. And so that's something they're seeing before I come into the room. And then um, one of the things we put in place quite a long time ago, and I, uh, I borrowed this idea from a colleague as well, but it's done really well for us, is we created a, uh, a wall of, of photos of good, happy, successful patients. And I love that because if you get a patient who comes in and maybe they're on the younger side for it and they're a little frightened about the idea of it, they've never worn a contact lens of any sort. They don't like eye drops. They don't know if they can do it. And yet as they're walking down the hallway, they see a whole wall full of pictures of kids who have been successful in the program. And some of them are close to their age. And, you know, we it's very diverse with ages and genders and races and everything like that. So you kind of see somebody who looks a little like you, looks around your age, your level of maturity. And so in our office, we call our Ortho K program Overnight Sight. And so that's our overnight successes. And they're up there. And we, uh, they, when they get to the point that they're finalized, we take a picture of them. And, um, you know, they look for themselves on the wall. And we kind of rotate the pictures in and out. Or they're walking down and, hey, there's, there's Steve from my T-ball team or whatever. And uh, so it's, it's a nice marketing tool, but it's also a great awareness tool also. So again, that concept of if, if a patient comes in and it's not a myopia control candidate, it's a 48-year-old person, but that 48-year-old person may very well have a teenager who is a progressive myo or may have a, a child who has a friend on their swim team who's yeah. a progressive myo. And so if you create that awareness, then that's going to be a, a bit organic in how things build from there. Yeah, I think the 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 great part about that is your myopia coordinator can you know by and large be the one who drives that conversation and you know takes remi- remembers to take the picture of people sure. and those mm-hmm. sort of things that yeah. that that is that is fantastic. Well, yeah. I've taken a lot away from this, particularly around how I think I have 
a culture of myopia in my practice, but just the things that your coordinator can do sure. to drive that message really, sure. I think is a, is a great thing. And uh, I want to bring you back on the myopia podcast another time to create, to talk about creating a myopia culture in your practice, because it sounds okay. like you've done a really, really great job with that. Thanks for telling us about your myopia coordinator. What a, a great concept. And, um, I also checked out your website. If anybody wants to learn a little bit more about you, they can check out your website at carryfamilyeyecare.com. And uh, you've, uh, you've done a really good job of helping create this culture of, of myopia even before people walk in. Uh, appreciate you, Dr. Barnes, and thank you for joining us for this episode. Cool. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Please make sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time on the Myopia Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.